Sorry? Jaime. Jaime. <laughs> He's going to pronounce that himself. So, um, Luis? Yes. Exactly. Yes. And uh, they, um, uh, they are both CTO, that's correct? CTO and CTO. CTO for yeah. uh, the Arcturus BioCloud. Yeah. And they are going to talk about something so exciting that uh, genetic engineering as a service. So, big, big hand to. Good. Okay. <coughs> Hello everyone, my name is Jaime, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Arturus Biocloud. And my name is Luis Silva, I'm from Brazil, I'm the CTO of and co-founder of Arturus Biocloud as well. I'm a software developer and I had this dream of developing life as I developed software. Yeah, awesome. And actually, it's Luis who got me involved in genetic engineering and all the stuff you're going to listen today about. Okay, so today I'm dividing this presentation between a little bit how we started, so you can get the sort of a sense of uh, why we're doing this. And the second part is like, how can people get more involved? And actually it's simpler than we think. Yes. So, how it all started. <coughs> Back in 2014, Luis and I were both uh, two out of the 80 people that participate yearly at Singularity University's graduate study program. How many here, by raising hands, have heard about Singularity University? Awesome, so this is yeah. a great crowd. And um, during this process, we shared to me a lot about his vision on genetics, and he'll explain a little bit more later on, but this really clicked on how can we leverage on this exponential technology to solve humans' challenges. So here, the three of us, um, Pedro, our third co-founder, during the program, we got together and we started this company. And he's gonna yeah, start. and biology has become digital. So every technology that became like when you have a technology that is digital, it grows at exponential rate. So we tend to think in a linear way. Uh, we don't realize that uh, exponential technologies they grow, they look grow slow, but when you see the curve, you have an explosion, a knee curve and it grows super fast. So uh, we have companies like Kodak, for example, that in the past, they uh, saw the opportunity of digital cameras. Uh, it was exponential technology, but they passed it by, so they got out of the business. So that's uh, what they call exponential technologies. And biology is exponential technology. It's becoming information. So right now we have a lot of DNA sequencing. Uh, we are synthesized DNA. The price of base pairs of DNA has become super cheap, and uh, we are achieving the point where we can print life, we can change life, we can understand life. And together with artificial intelligence and machine learning, you are learning more about DNA and learning how to create new organisms, uh, new life. See why he got me involved in biotechnology? Yeah. This is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we started out our Curious Bio Club. We wanted to bring this technology to everyone. Uh, we added a fourth member to the team. You know, we needed a scientist after all. Yes. Um, and he's a great guy, Don. And this is in our office while we were in San Francisco. We were part of IndieBio, uh, the first biotech accelerator. Um, they invested in us, gave us space, mentorship, and we began. We began this journey. And we started out by building the basics, a small robot that automated the lab protocols for doing DNA assembling, transformation, plating, and, and so on, incubating, and so on. So this little robot actually equipped all the different things you needed in a lab to do this process. Then we, got, we became more ambitious, and we jumped to do a bigger robot. You know, basically it's adding more capabilities, so it can even take uh, different images that our customer wanted to, to read out. So if you can see in this image, you got different parts. And the idea was that anyone from internet can go to our webpage, choose the different genes they wanted, it, and the robot would run the whole experiment, and then you would be able to see it online. So that was our first prototype. It was our way of putting something in the market. We learned a lot, but then we shifted more to a different focus. Let's help researchers um, 
use technology from the best labs in the United States. So basically, what you do is you just paste your code, <coughs> choose one different test you want to do that you would have, you would do in a lab, and we do the whole thing for you. Basically, you see the result. This got some media attention. We were on, uh, uh, mentioned in TechCrunch while we were building. And what we see now the future in this field that we're doing is going beyond just doing it physically in the lab. It's about simulating, using in, in artificial intelligence to interpret that data so we can iterate quickly. Biology, in some sense, is kind of slow. We need to use computers to speed up that process. So this brings me to the second part, what we can do with this technology. And crowdfunding is actually a great platform for doing so. So today we see pharma companies, you know, if you want to develop a new drug, if it's not really profitable, then I won't do it. So companies are somehow not doing all the things that we need to solve humans' problems. And that's where DIY biohackers come into place. People that have the knowledge have the skills and want to share with the world. So I'll give you an example that we worked with. Um, there was a group of biohackers back in San Francisco that they were working on the idea of what if we can make an open source uh, insulin? Can we share this protocol with the world? And that's how we started a crowdfunding campaign using experiment.com, a really amazing platform that I recommend if you want to do crowdfunding for science because they had, you don't give a product back, you don't give t-shirts back, you, people share money because they wanna see the science becoming true. So we did our first campaign, Open Source Insulin. Uh, this is the lab in Counter Crucial Labs uh, up in Oakland, very close from San Francisco. And we raised over $16,000 from people, um, you know, average Joe. They wanted it to have this made real and now we're working on it. Then we jumped to, there's a second project. I'm not involved. Luis is a bit more involved yes. in that. Um, you can share a little bit of this if yeah. you want. In Brazil right now, we have a huge problem with the Zika virus. So we have millions of people infected. And I have a friend from Simulized University as well. And he's a researcher from Israel. And he came to Brazil and he started to work in an open source diagnostic kit to test Zika virus in the poor regions of Brazil. Because in the north of the country of Brazil, we don't have hospital. Uh, we have millions of people infected, and they don't have access to technology. So this guy, he's developing an uh, open source platform where they can go to these poor areas and test the Zika virus. And it's a super important project. And right now it's on experiment.com, and they're raising money uh, to go to the next phase. This is, I think, last week's update. I forgot to update this slide. They, they raised way more than this so far. So that's amazing. And here we see like Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. Uh, and I look to biology as software development. And I see everything as code. And when you start to play with DNA and you see the ACTGs, it's like assembly code from software development. Uh, we don't have like a high level language yet in biotechnology. We are creating that. Uh, but I can say to you that I can change the positions of the ACTGs, I can join together, I can express new proteins, and it's became more and more fun. For me, as I'm not a researcher, I'm a software developer, it's a new world. I can code life, and it's amazing because life it has its own hardware and software at the same time. It's a totally exponential concept. And I think more people should be involved in coding life because it's super important to have the democratization of technology and knowledge to everybody. Everybody can know, children can know how to make growing bacteria, how to change DNA and create new things. Yeah, but, uh, the, and the fact is that you know, this building stuff in your garage, uh, software, hardware, yeah, it's sort of simple. But when we try to do this in, 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 in bio, biology, it sort of not, doesn't translate that easily. It's kind of like, to do. Oop. Did it just finish? Okay. Try again. Okay, for you. Hit me. <laughs> or did it just freeze? <coughs> okay. So I just started looking some memes in the internet, pretty much saying, you know, 
biology is not an easy thing to do, you yeah. know, everybody struggles at doing it, and we did as well at the beginning. It's a lot, yeah. It's hard. So, one of the things that happen, uh, and how researchers or people work in this industry, is that you have these four steps, and this has been happening for a while. You design the experiment in your mind, this is the sequence of the bacteria, or this is how the bacteria should work, and so on, and then you go into the lab, you execute it, you test out, you get that data, you learn, and you repeat. So this is, this is nice, this is a, uh, iterations. But in reality, what happens is that time is not equally allocated between all these tasks. So you spend a little bit of time being creative, and most of the time being, you know, a human pipette. And it's not bad to pipette, it's just that it becomes frustrating if you, that's the only thing you're doing. So this is the part where Arthur sort of decided we have to tackle that problem. If we take that away, more people can become designers and not actually need all those skills that you require for the lab. So that's why we built this company with that goal. Basically, there's just three steps to go. You have to design your DNA sequence, and that's something that if you have certain knowledge, um, you can pick out different genes from different repositories around the internet. Uh, we even have a demo online on how you can use the iGen repository, the International Genetically Engineered Machine Competitions um, repository, drag and drop, and build your own design, and then upload it to Arcturus Biofilm, and we'll actually build it using uh, really good facilities in the United States, and then give you back the data that you want. Do you want to see how it's producing RNA or protein and so on? So then you can iterate this, this loop. So we see this also like, just like in software, there's different layers. There's people doing infrastructure, um, hardware, and so on. What we decided is to be in this layer on top of that, where we can tackle all these different technologies and put it under one roof, so people can build applications on top, on top of that. So I'll give a few examples of what people are building uh, with synthetic biology. One of them is Clara Foods. They shared the lab space and, and the accelerator program with us at San Francisco. And what they're doing is producing egg white without the chicken. So for real, like vegan egg white. And it's, it sounds like sci-fi, but when you see the, the science behind it, it's really feasible. What you're doing is genetically modifying yeast to produce the proteins that you would find in the egg white. And there are like 15 different proteins in the egg white. Basically, with 10 of those, you have a uh, good, you know, useful one. And he changes, modifies e yeast so he can get that protein and then recombine it, 90% <coughs> of it water, and you get egg white. And the same concept was applied by another company, well, actually, previously, and they're doing milk. So this is a way of how you can re-engineer microbes to do stuff that we need. And this is a nice example of the algae that was changed by genetic engineering to deliver cancer drugs inside the, the body of a human patient. Mm -hmm. So when you uh, use cancer drugs, you have this huge problem that the cancer drugs usually they kill good cells, not just the bad ones. And the scientists, the researchers, they develop this method, use a nanorobot that I call it's a green nanorobot, it's an algae. They change the DNA of this algae. Uh, this algae can uh, go inside the body with a payload of a cancer drug and target just the bad cells. And it's a really amazing project because here we can see a really nice example of how can you use synthetic bio to, to heal people and to cure cancer. Yeah, so the question is like, what would you build? If you have the capabilities, what do you want to do? Thank you very much. Brilliant, thank you so much guys, you're making a real difference in the world. Do we have time for more, for any questions? Yeah, two minutes. Yes. Okay, any smart person with a question? Woman, on, you were the quickest one. Yeah, hi, I'm Danielle Wild, I'm from um, Colling in Denmark. Um, uh, while I can see the extraordinary usefulness of taking away the tedium of the execution uh, and and things like that I also have enormous hesitations reservations about it because a lot of the learning the learning doesn't happen at the end the learning happens while you are executing while you are doing 
tasks that may be occurring within your body and so your brain is given the opportunity to think in other ways. And if all of those tasks are outsourced, then that opportunity for thinking and reflecting and finding other, other ways, serendipitous discoveries, is actually removed from the creative process. And I, I find, have a bit of a concern with that um, in terms of your proposal. Okay. Basically, good the, question. Yes, that's good. Basically, the parts that we're um, taking off that, that weight from the user is pretty much basic testing. So for example, RNA expression and protein expression, they're very standardized uh, procedures, uh, different gels, and the, there's, I wouldn't say, there's too much room for serendipitous to happen. It's pretty much reading the, the, the gel to see uh, what is the indicator. So the part where you would have more creativity to change is in the designing phase. We don't have time for a long debate, but sure, give a quick comment. I'm actually talking about what your brain does when it's occupied doing something that's really boring, and that's when a lot of creativity happens. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant awesome. point. Uh, my comment on this, if I can step in, is that not every car driver has to be a car engineer. So there are different competences that can be applied. Thank you, guys. Uh, you'll be available during the day. Yes,